Okay, well, um, that's going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, I didn't realise when I came here today that I would be sandwiched and surrounded by motor archaeologists. So uh, this is the token gesture from everywhere else. Um, I'd first like to say thank you for Sadie for allowing me to speak at this session and also for TAG for hosting uh, a session entirely focusing on the commercial sector. Uh, I think it's extremely valid and relevant at the moment. We are seeing uh, growing issues and challenges that we're all going to have to deal with and um, if, we continue, if we are to continue as we have been. And I want to talk about one of these one of these challenges today, but it will be a really boring, dry subject matter. It's not going to be about archaeology much. <laughs> okay. Uh, as uh, as I was introduced, I've set up an archaeological consultancy. Uh, I've been in archaeology for 15, 20 years. I had a brief stint as a planning archaeologist at Buckinghamshire County Council, uh, and I'm currently undertaking a master's in planning. So. To get down to business, the, my talk today, as you see, is going to be on viability and planning and what impact viability has on the way we operate and the frameworks in which we work. Okay? I think um, the first thing to do is to define what is viability and what has it got to do with archaeology. <coughs> okay, up there on the slide, first slide, first sentence, you can see uh, the dictionary definition of viability. Uh, to a lay person, essentially viability is, is something worthwhile over the long term. Now, as I'm sure you'll agree, viability, therefore, is quite a vague term. And you have to ask the question, viability for whom and viability for what? Now, there are different types of viability. Of course, we have environmental envi uh, viability, which is the domain in which we all operate. We have uh, social uh, viability and um, and of course um, economic viability which we'll come on to so viability is important to archaeology because it is embedded within the planning system and the planning system of course dictates and drives how we operate our very employment and um, Many of you obviously will uh, know the National Planning Policy Framework from 2012, or elements of it. Some of you may be aware of the revisions that went on in 2018 and its final revision of this year. Um, but that framework dictates how we work, our, empl our very employment, as I said. Um, Every single archaeologist, I believe, should at least have an awareness of the very small section within the MPPF conserving and enhancing the historic environment. Because that's the bit we always focus on. You see it in WSI, you see it in reports, it's, it's always there. Um, but in order to understand viability, I believe you must understand the MPPF in its entirety, the full 59-page document, and not just that little section that relates to what we do. The MPPF, when it came out in 2012, had three overriding functions, let's say. One was to amalgamate a wealth of previous planning policy guidance, of which there was thousands of sheets of paper documents, into a single coherent document. Two, to facilitate house building by streamlining the already heavily bureaucratic process. And I'm sure some developers today will still complain that it's still <laughs> too bureaucratic. Uh, and three, to promote sustainable development, and it's that that I want to focus on and relates to viability. So, like viability, the word sustainable is extremely <coughs> vague uh, and means many things to many people. It's certainly the buzzword uh, at the moment. Governments across the world are using this term within their policy, within their legislation, and arguably, <coughs> its sustainability is the topic of, of our generation whether it be climate change uh, or burning of rainforests, etc. And archaeology is no different from that. But what about sustainable development? Well, sustainability and sustainable development has three defining areas, which you see on the slide here. We have society, we have economy, and we have environment. And ideally where you want to be is that <coughs> sweet spot in the middle where you are providing equal weight to all three. 
In reality, that doesn't happen. The NPPF, when it was created, decided to define uh, uh, sustainability in terms of viability. And it decided to define viability in terms of economic viability for the landowner and for the developer. Here, the NPPF is very specific. And indeed, if I go back a couple of slides, uh, the bottom sentence here, this is from the PPG. So this is the guidance document that planners use to interpret the NPPF, um, the very vague NPPF. And already we're starting to see uh, the word viability come up. We're using cost. We are and energy. So it's already been portrayed there that viability is an important issue. So economic viability has always played a role in the background from a developer's point of view. But the MPPF put it front and centre, made it, uh, embedded it within policy and, 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 and the policy framework. So it, uh, it made it a material consideration of planning, and planning departments up and down the country have to consider viability when you're on developments that have planning conditions. And of course, archaeology is a planning condition. It's become a major factor in planning policy, and as a result of its introduction, developers have the right to challenge planning obligations through the use of viability, and particularly an instrument called viability assessment. Uh, and this is, this is what the impact, one of the sections of the impact that talks about viability. So, what is viability assessment? How does it work? Uh, it's very simple, really. Um, it's the official process to determine whether or not a project, any development, is either viable or not viable for the developer and the landowner when sites involve planning obligations. A very simple equation. And what happens is you add up your direct costs, which could be the cost of materials, the cost of the purchase of the land, the construction costs, and of course, the costs of the planning obligations, which includes archaeology. You then add up your direct profit, what the landowner, what the developer wants to make. You put the two together. You then work out how much you're going to make from selling that piece of land and everything that's on it, the houses, the school, whatever. You take one from the other. And what you're left with is this residual land value. This is the key uh, figure sorting the equation. That determines whether a project is viable under its current proposal. Now, the other key figure uh, is the threshold land value, this one, TLB. So the threshold land value is the value of that piece of land as it currently exists, if it was sold as it currently exists, plus any uplift that the landowner wishes to make. You then subtract the residual land value from the TLB. If the TLV is higher than the residual land value, so if, if the threshold land value of what it'd be worth now is more than once you've done all the development and sold it, then the project is deemed unviable, economically viable. Obviously, if it's the other way around, it is viable. So that's how it really works in theory. Uh, but what about practice? So a number of scholars and planners have raised major concerns about how viability assessment works in practice. Interestingly, I've found no such concerns amongst archaeologists. I've found no scholars, no archaeological scholars, no one writing about this. Um, there are four, four points of contention with viability assessment in practice. Firstly, we're dealing with complex and uncertain data. So these are, you're having to estimate costs. Okay, you're having to estimate what the fixed cost of the archaeological work is going to be in advance, which we all know is quite difficult to predict. And of course, you're having to estimate the cost of land value, and what you and in, and what apparatus you use to make that valuation. So there's intrinsic uncertainty in the data. The second thing is it's there's a preference of quantitative data, not qualitative data, and 
that is another major issue simply because it is trying to, it overlooks all the qualitative elements of planning game for the community. And it tries to put environmental and social issues into a quantifiable uh, element. The third issue we've got is reasonable rates of return. So this is related to the threshold land value, TLV. Um, this idea that the landowner must give a figure of what that land will be worth plus his uplift. There's been questions about when, how he gets to that estimation. Is he basing it on the land value now, or on the land value when the houses may be sold in 10 or 15 years' time? So that's not quantifiable, really. But by far the biggest issue is who is producing these viability assessments. Anyone has a guess? Developer. Exactly. The developer produces these. There's no requirement for them to produce them. But, and, and local planning authorities do produce these, but by and large, local planning authorities, as we know, are under-resourced. They don't have the finances, the skill base to produce these, and so they are left to the developer to produce them. And that, in itself, raises massive questions of conflict of interest. So, um, sorry, come back to that. So, as an example, <coughs> Most development produces a return of 12 to 15%. In viability modelling, the developer can set the level at about 20%, so at the high end. Um, then you have the issue of uh, basically developer, all the time developers trying to get that residual land value as low as possible and increase the threshold value to the point where the development becomes unviable. Now, an unviable development doesn't necessarily mean that development won't happen just that in its current shape and form, it's not deliverable. And since the MPPF promotes and supports economic viability over other considerations, <coughs> it takes precedent. This then gives a developer uh, the opportunity to challenge planning obligations in order to make a, a development viable once again. Soft target, yes, but nevertheless they do that. Now, we all know and we say regularly that archaeology in terms of planning operations, it's minuscule, it's tiny, it's nothing. And you are right, the big uh, planning obligation is indeed affordable housing, social housing. But that doesn't mean that the historic environment is immune from this type of assessment. And we will see this in a couple of uh, examples that I'm going to highlight. So, I have four examples I want to demonstrate to you today. The first two aren't specifically related to the historic environment but they are being used to demonstrate the use of viability assessment as a means to reduce planning obligations. So uh, I'll go this very brief, fairly briefly. The first, the first one involves a development in Kempston in Bedfordshire. Uh, the developer has, well, has now, but put up, that's 3,000 houses. Uh, under the MS106 agreement, we had the developer to produce a medical, provide a medical centre, a community building and a large supermarket. The developer then decided, no, I don't like this, I don't really want to build all these extra things. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to undertake a viability assessment. I'm going to get my team of experts in to produce this viability assessment. And I'm going to, and as a result, he demonstrated this, or he understood it, demonstrated that the development would have a 10 million pound deficit should these planning obligations be applied. So he appealed, it went to appeal, and the council found, due to viability, they found in favour of the developer. As a result, neither the medical centre nor the community building was built, and the large supermarket was a tiny corner shop. This is an example of viability assessment being used directly to reduce planning operations. Planning operations are there to benefit society. The second example, which is a little bit closer to home, uh, is in the borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, it's a site in Beaufort Gardens uh, called Parks Hotel. Um, again, uh, developer got planning consent to, uh, to read about this site, subject to uh, a raft of planning conditions. Uh, again, the developer said, well, I don't really want to pay for this, I don't really want to have this done. Bear in mind, this is prime central land. The developer produced a viability assessment where he argued that under any level of planning obligation, he would make a loss. Any. And that the loss would be £7 million. 
So the council disagree with this, and in this case, produce their own viability assessment. And on that occasion, they said, no, hang on, our calculation is that you're going to make a £12 million profit prior to planning applications being applied. So you can see the, the uh, contradiction in figures here. So it goes off to appeal, and again, the, uh, the, the, the uh, council ruled in favour of the uh, developer based on viability grounds. No planning conditions were undertaken on that site. Now, I can't say there's archaeology there. What I can say that's in the conservation area, which is, as you know, a designated heritage asset. So, over all these obligations, over all these examples show how obligations related to public benefit services can be compromised should viability, financial viability be called into question. But what about the historic environment? Okay, so let's move on. This is what we're talking about. These two, two, two examples. As part of my research, I've undertaken further study of planning appeals in England, stretching back to 2012. And as a result of that, I found a raft of appeals related to viability assessment and, interestingly, a number of them related to the historic environment. Most of those historic environment ones are related to either listed buildings or conservation. <coughs> possibly, I can't prove this, but possibly because such things are more tangible in below ground heritage. Uh, this is a, a case in Bournemouth, Radcliffe Court. The building is not listed, but it is in a conservation area. Uh, the developer applied uh, to renovate it, and was, uh, the conservation officer's advice was sought, and uh, planning permission was granted, subject to the retention of the building and, and, and refurbishment. Again, the developer didn't like this. He thought it'd be a lot, can make a lot more money if he de demolishes this building, puts up in something new. So he said, so the developer got his team of experts together, did a viability assessment, um, and and they said, and this is this is their this is their survey said, refurbishment was not considered to be a viable proposition due to the condition of the building and insufficient use of space versus returns. So, economics is at the bottom of this. The developer then re-submitted an application for demolition in 2015. Uh, the council sought the advice of English Heritage, who advised the proposed development in the application would further erode the special character of the conservation area, that is if it's demolished. The conservation officer agreed with the assessment by English Heritage, and they objected to the demolition. It went to appeal, and Bournemouth Borough Council, under Section Par Justify, Bournemouth Borough Council agreed that the project was not viable under its current situation, and allowed for demolition. And they justified it under Paragraph One Three Three of the MPPF. My final case today. I realise I've only got five minutes left, but this is this is the key one. This is evidence of violent assessment that can direct that in archaeology, and it's a, a new case. It's this year, so it's current. Um, Thames Valley Hospice, a charity, put in a planning application for a new 28-bedroom hospice, outpatient unit, education centre and associated works. Planning permission was granted by Berkshire County Council in March 2018, subject to a standard archaeological condition. And there is the condition. If anyone, any of you work in commercial or see conditions, it's, a, it's an absolutely bog standard condition and a reason. And indeed... Uh, it's in an area of archaeological potential. So the archaeological officer advised for a measured staged approach, uh, starting off with an evaluation. The evaluation was conducted in, 20, in January of this year, identified buried remains of prehistoric date, both pottery and worked flint. As a result of the uh, evaluation report that came out, the archaeological officer said, OK, I would like a further stage of work that the areas that the small area where we found this flint, I want it to be undertaken an open air excavation. It's in the footprint of them. The rest, fine, but this area, I'd like it stripped. At that point, the Thames Hospice stepped in. They said, no, we're not having this. And they decided to challenge the archaeological condition in its entirety, have it removed based on economic grounds. They argued that any further cost of archaeological work, which was estimated through competitive tendering at a value of £30,000 for the open air excavation, could not be justified in a project that was estimated worth seven million. 
the charity felt, in their words, unable to justify to its patrons the additional expenditure required for mindless archaeological investigations. <laughs> they appealed to Ber Berkshire Council, and guess what? Archaeology condition was removed. Council agreed with the applicant based on viability. So I'm just going to sum up now, and I've put a phrase up here, determining value based on economics alone and the pitfalls of it. So ever since the Town and Country Planning Act in 1947, there it is there, uh, the reason for planning operations has been principally in order to provide public benefit, whether it be infrastructure, housing, the environment, parks, uh, and there's another one coming up in a second, uh, <laughs> woodland, but of course it also includes our the past, the historic environment, through the investigation and dis uh, dissemination of knowledge. Viability has long been a consideration of planning policy and implementation, but present day emphasis on financial viability alone to determine in value threatens established social public benefits that should be at the heart of planning policy. I've highlighted here some of the complexities of VA, that if the use of VA is in undertaken in order to reduce or remove planning conditions, then the archaeological sector should be aware of this and needs to, to engage more with developers so that they cannot use this loophole. The role of planning must remain beyond private interests, as decades of planning legislation have shown and benefit society as a whole. To this end, our sector cannot avoid the emphasis placed on financial viability, both from a developer's point of view and our own point of view. And we must put, quantify the benefits of cultural heritage. And that's it, thank you. <laughs>